Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second installment of the new National Climate Assessment Roundtable Series. My name is Larry Perez. I'm part of the National Park Service Climate Change Response Program out here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And right off the bat, I want to let you know that today's broadcast is being live captioned through the kind assistance of Fed Relay. So if any of you would like to take advantage of that captioning, just go ahead and use that link that we're going to be posting in the chat box down below, and that will connect you up directly with that service. This whole entire roundtable series has really been crafted and is dedicated to delivering area-specific information to units of the national park system within each of the 10 national climate assessment regions. The roundtables are really valuable opportunities, we think, to discuss and ask questions about all of the latest findings from the 2018 assessment. And so we really encourage everyone's participation today. Um, the series will be going on throughout the end of the year, and towards the end of this presentation, we're going to share a little bit more information about the schedule. But for now, we're going to post a link into the chat box with not only links to past uh, series episodes, but also the schedule for the upcoming roundtables as well. But as for today's roundtable, it's going to focus squarely on the parks in the Alaska region of the assessment. If you should happen to be calling in from parks outside of the Alaska region, that's okay. We still welcome your participation and encourage you to attend today's roundtable. Just know that subsequent installments are going to be focusing on additional regions across the national park system throughout the coming year. And again, recordings to all those past events and all those coming up are going to be available at that link in the chat box. Just a quick snapshot of today's agenda. In just a moment, we're going to be hearing from Mr. Jeremy Littell on findings and impacts and actions from the Fourth National Climate Assessment. And we're going to follow that with a brief question and answer period directly with Jeremy. After that, we'll segue into a panel discussion that features a number of uh, invited guests from parks within the Alaska region. And we'll follow that with a second round of Q&A as well. And we will plan to end this broadcast promptly at 1230 Alaska time. I will be one of two facilitators today for this roundtable. I would also like to introduce my close friend and colleague, Matt Holly. Will be helping us manage all of our technology today. And speaking of the technology, just a few quick words as we get started on how this is all going to work. All the functionality for today's roundtable will be available through the webinar interface. And you can access that directly using this tiny toolbar that you should see on your desktop right now. If you currently don't see panels associated with this toolbar, you can fly them out by clicking on that little orange button at the very top of the toolbar. That will fly out your layers panel. Just know that periodically, by default, some of these panels may want to auto-collapse on you. You ideally want them to stay open for the duration of the webinar. So you can set it to do so by clicking on View at the top of the menu and then deselecting the auto-hide um, selection that's currently there. Radio buttons that you will find under your audio panel are going to tell you exactly how you're connected up to this webinar right now. For best quality, we really highly encourage you to dial in by phone rather than using your computer audio. If you're currently connected by computer audio, just go ahead and switch over by clicking on the phone call dialog or radio button, and you can uh, then dial in by phone and switch over. We have quite a few participants online with us today, including not only NPS staff, but also partners from Fish and Wildlife Service, partners from National Parks Conservation Association, and others, and we're so happy to have you joining us today. Because of the large number of folks on this call, the participants are all muted by default to keep background noise in check. However, again, we encourage your active participation throughout all of this. These roundtables are really golden opportunities for asking questions from both our invited experts as well as our on-the-ground practitioners relative to the parks that you work in, relative to the work that you're doing, relative to the challenges that you're facing on a daily basis with regards to this issue. So, we really welcome you to bring your voice into the room, and there are two ways two ways to do that today. First off, during uh, our Q&A sessions, if you have a question that you want to ask verbally, just find the raise your hand icon on the webinar interface, and we'll unmute you one by one to ask your question. So just to make sure everyone's familiar with this, everyone who can hear my voice right now, go ahead and raise your hand using that button. I'm seeing some hands coming up, Larry. They're popping up one by one by one. Awesome. Excellent. So you can use that button anytime during this webinar. And Matt's going to go ahead and lower everyone's hands right now. There's a second modality by which you can ask questions. 
In addition to our dedicated question and answer sessions, we welcome and encourage you to submit questions at any point in time, whatever's on your mind. To do so, just enter your text into the questions dialog box at the bottom of your webinar interface. Matt and I will be monitoring for incoming questions and pose them to our speakers and panelists at the first opportunity that we get. Additionally, if you have any issues with the tech that you're experiencing, you can use the same questions panel to contact Matt and I behind the scenes for support. Last thing, this webinar is going to be recorded for um, sharing online and for your future reference, so just be aware of that as well. Enough of the tech, we want to get things kicked off. To do so, I'd like to invite Kat Hawkins Hoffman, who is our current chief of our National Park Service Climate Change Response Program, to share a few words to kick off the roundtable. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, I have pledged to keep this short. They don't let me anywhere close to the technology, so I'm not here to help with that. But uh, I did want to say just three things. Um, first, to welcome everybody and thank you for your interest in this issue. Um, it has been said many times, and you guys in Alaska see it firsthand. There is, I think, no more critical issue in the Park Service or in conservation or in the world at large than what we're doing to deal with climate change. So thanks for showing up and being interested. Um, secondly, I really want to thank Lee Welling for helping to organize the panel and thank the panelists, um, Suzanne and Philip and Lee, for their attention to this issue and um, being willing to speak and share their experiences. And then um, Jeremy Littell, thanks so much. Um, I was a co-author on the adaptation chapter for the National Climate Assessment, so I know um, a little bit, maybe not the same as the regional chapters, but I certainly know the level of work that went into this. And having you with us to present the more local knowledge and local findings is just fantastic. Lastly is uh, just encouragement. You heard Larry say it. We've organized these sessions to be very friendly to interaction and questions, and we encourage you to submit questions, to raise your hand. There's nobody judging any of the questions. There's no question that's too small or too, well, there may be some complicated ones, but ask anything. We want this to be as interactive as, as possible. It's a great opportunity for you to be able to ask one of the scientists that contributed to the Alaska chapter so, and the other participants. I'll shut up now, and I'll stay away from the tech, because <laughs> I break stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. I really appreciate that. Uh, I am very excited and happy to welcome Jeremy Littell as our featured speaker today. Jeremy is an author on the 4th National Climate Assessment Alaska chapter, but in his day job, he's a climate impact ecologist with the USGS. He works at the Alaska Climate Adaptation Science Center in Anchorage and has over 15 years of experience developing scientific research and translating climate impact science for a wide range of stakeholders. His research interests include climatically driven processes and changes in Arctic and Alpine ecosystems, including wildfire, snow, and microclimate. And Jeremy, we're going to go ahead and pitch over to you control for this session. And while we do so, just want to say thanks again. Overjoyed to have you joining us today. And the platform is yours. Thank you for that introduction, both to you and Kat, and to everybody on the line for making time today to uh, <clears throat> to listen. I'm going to see if I can organize my uh, desktop here so that I can see my slides. Can you all see now? We we can see you. Yes, indeed. And we see your slide full screen. You're all ready to go. All right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I want to again thank um, Lee and Larry and Kat um, and all of you uh, for uh, making the time and also for uh, for asking me to present. I want to make it clear right away that uh, I'm not the only one behind this chapter. There's a long list of folks, and I'll show you their names in a minute briefly. I also want to say that uh, I included some more information in here, both to update on some of the interesting things going on in Alaska since uh, the even the most recent National Climate Assessment. Um, uh, but some added information that uh, I was asked to include uh, in order to make uh, this more relevant for the region. Uh -oh. hmm. There we go. Okay, so, uh, so information from the Alaska chapter of the 4th National Climate Assessment and some related science of interest. Um, 
these are the, the authors for the Alaska chapter, and so anything that I make an error in presenting today is mine alone, but uh, if we'd had all of these folks on the line to uh, help contribute in the discussion, then probably we would have got it uh, closer to right. So if you have any quibbles with things I'm about to say, please let me know, and then I'll uh, bring in whoever we need to to get it right. But this is definitely an effort uh, on the, the part of many dozens of people. Uh, and with a wide range of expertise. Some of them have been working in Alaska for a very long time. And this tells you a little bit about the volume of information that uh, one could try to deliver uh, in a, a webinar this short. And I necessarily have to limit uh, some of the, uh, the content. Um, but all of these experts are available, I'm available, and we'll do our best uh, to meet uh, needs of other information that you might need uh, if the things that I choose to highlight today don't either go deep enough into impacts specific to the parks, or if you're interested in the science that's evolved since then. So what's in NCA4 uh, as, as a whole, it's, it's worth noting before we get uh, very far that Chapter 26 on Alaska is one of just several chapters that have lots of information relevant to the Arctic and Alaska. Uh, volume 1 of the National Climate Assessment, which came out in, in 2017, is focused more specifically on the, the physical climate changes and their impacts in some cases to ecosystems. So there's a lot of relevant information there. And then the rest of it, um, the volume two, which has to do with impacts and adaptation, uh, all, of these, um, all of these chapters have specific call-outs to Alaska or Arctic issues. Um, I noted that Kat made mention of the adaptation chapter, which I've not actually included here, um, in, in part because this was mostly for an impact slide that I put together. Uh, but you can see that you could spend a lot of time figuring out what NCA4 has to say about Alaska and that that information spread widely through the assessment. It's also mostly confined to new work since NCA3. Uh, so the last National Climate Assessment had specific topics that it addressed for Alaska and uh, that are also of interest to the park. And in reality, you need to put together the chain of previous assessments with NCA4 to get a full picture. So just because it's not an NCA4 or highlighted there doesn't necessarily mean it isn't important. It just means that there's new science, and that's what the assessment chose to focus on. So that said, I'll jump in a little bit and tell you something that um, probably you're already aware of, but uh, for our friends from outside Alaska, this may be news. Um, this is just a, a trace of the statewide annual average temperature provided by Rick Toman, one of our co-authors on NCA4 Alaska chapter. And if you pay attention closely to the statistics, what you see is that there isn't really a discernible trend in uh, statewide temperature um, for the, the first part of the period of record until the mid-1970s. And then after that, it detectably increases. You'll also notice that there's a tremendous amount of year-to-year -year variability here in Alaska. And that's in part because we're juxtaposed between the Arctic and the North Pacific, um, which are themselves places of high variability. And so in order to see the trend, you have to account for the variation. That said, it's increasing, uh, temperature is increasing in Alaska, roughly seven degrees Fahrenheit a century since the mid-70s, and that's over twice the national average. Now, you hear that number a lot. Alaska is warming twice the national average, or twice the global rate. I want to put a finer point on that and show that Alaska is a tremendously diverse place geographically and climatically, and that average, that, two, that twice the rate, that's spread out over the entire state. What these numbers on this map of Alaska indicate is the rate of warming for the various climate divisions, which are those um, polygons bounded by the black line. And uh, you can see, for example, 2.6 on the north slope. That means that it's 2.6 times the, um, uh, the warming rate for the lower 48 states, less so, say, down in the Aleutians or in southeast. But you can take home the message that parts of Alaska are warming faster than the lower 48, almost all of it but some of them are even warming even faster than that. And so the rate of change here is, is, is stunning. It's a very fast rate of temperature change. What does that mean um, by the 21st century? Um, you, these same numbers now are the, t the change in degrees Fahrenheit um, between the end of the 20th century and the end of the 21st for a higher emission scenario averaged across five of the more recent climate models. And uh, so 14 degrees Fahrenheit on the North Slope, for example, 11 in the interior of Alaska, 7 or 8 or even 9 in the, the uh, more southerly parts of the state. Um, and that projected warming is greater than the historical variability even by the 2050s. You don't have to wait till the end of the century to get to that value. The size of that change is similar to that from the last ice age to the historical period. 
but it's happening in 100 years rather than you know something like 10,000. And uh, we can quibble about the, the, the fine points of those numbers, but that's a, an astonishing rate of, of climatic change. Precipitation is projected to increase in Alaska in all seasons. You may have seen some news reporting on this in the future. Uh, uh, climate um, averaged across many climate models. It's worth noting that in, uh, in, the, in some parts of southeast, that's less certain for the summertime. But in general, you get more annual average precipitation going into the future, and quite a bit more, uh, often 40, 50, 60 percent more in some of the, the higher Arctic and the interior. Um, for most of Alaska, uh, those changes are larger than the historical variability, and they are significant pretty quickly. So it's a warmer, wetter future. However, um, the increase in summer temperature is large enough the changes in permafrost and the rates of permafrost thaw large enough that the consequences of that for water availability to plants and then the impacts on things like fire are still the subject of a lot of studies. So it's paradoxically possibly true that you could have an increase in overall precipitation and a decrease in, uh, in the soil moisture and, and plant, um, or sorry, fuel moisture um, that is relevant for fires uh, in, in many of those years. Um, the translation then um, comes with an increase in temperature, an increase or change in precipitation. What does that mean for snowpack? We've done a fair amount of this work um, for the state of Alaska. And again, the message gets a little bit uh, tricky to, um, to, uh, to deliver because you get the uh, expected decreases in, in snowpack accumulation, say springtime, April 1st snowpack, in the southern part of the state and in parts of the interior. Uh, large decreases in some cases, and by the late uh, 21st century, the wintertime um, uh, snowpack accumulation that you could expect to uh, be uh, in, in April 1st snowpack could decrease by uh, 20 to 30 percent in some of those interior areas and much larger in southeast Alaska and uh, in the coastal margins of south central. On the other hand, on that top uh, figure um, with the, the blues and pinks on it, you can see some blues, and those mean increases in snowpack on April 1st. And that's because as you get an increase in wintertime precipitation in those regions, it's still cold enough for most of that increased precip to fall as snow. So it's actually possible to get an increase in early spring snowpack, even in a climate change future. The real question then comes, what happens to that snow? So you could get more total snow accumulation, but an earlier start to that accumulation, um, an earlier melt um, in the springtime, and get a longer snow-free season even if you had more snow. So it's difficult to track those dynamics. The lower two panels with the blues and oranges um, show you uh, an estimate of what would happen in terms of whether the, uh, the annual uh, season of, of uh, runoff is dominated by snow or by, uh, more by rain. So the blues are the snow dominated where the snowpack uh, or, uh, accounts for most of the annual runoff in, in stream flow. And historically, most of Alaska, except for southeast and some of the coastal margins of uh, Prince William Sound, was snow dominated. By the 2080s, um, we expect quite a bit more what's called transitional, where the snow and rain vie for control of the annual hydrograph. And much of southeast even becomes permanently rain dominated. And so you get a real change in the, uh, the, the seasonality of, of snow and the role it plays in uh, regional uh, stream flow and runoff. Okay, that's a little bit on the climate, and the climate assessment has some information on that, but the real meat of it is what do the impacts mean for different systems in Alaska? And that depends a lot on who you are and what you do and what is uh, most important to you. And so some of the impacts in different parts of the region vary considerably. In other places, things are similar across much of the state. But uh, a lot of the uh, stuff that's highlighted in the National Climate Assessment Alaska chapter depends a great deal on who's asking. So the key message is, for the Alaska chapter, there are six of them, and I'm only going to focus on, on three, um, but all of them are, are important. And uh, the first one um, focuses on the marine environment, the second one on, um, on uh, changes in permafrost, river erosion, wildfire, and glacier melt, so kind of the physical drivers um, and the way they affect the landscape. Um, human health threats in Alaska uh, is the third key message. Fourth one, is uh, subsistence activities, culture, health, and infrastructure of Alaska's indigenous peoples. Um, the, the fifth one is uh, damage to infrastructure uh, that is driven by many of these factors at once. Uh, some places have combinations of 
two or three different factors that are affecting infrastructure. And then the sixth is proactive adaptation would reduce both the short and long term costs. Now, it should be evident right away that each of these key messages is kind of a complex system unto itself. It isn't any more just that it's warming, the precipitation will increase, there will be less snow, permafrost will thaw, glaciers will melt. Instead, each of these issues or sets of issues are all interrelated, and pulling them apart is quite difficult, and that should give you some idea of how hard it is to project um, specifically some of these impacts in places in Alaska. Now, I'm going to choose to highlight a few of these going forward to give you a flavor of what's in there and where we're at now in terms of research. Uh, obviously, I don't have time to go into all of them. So the first one I'm going to focus on is uh, marine ecosystems. And uh, increasingly, these are affected by retreating and thinning Arctic summer sea ice. So you see this in the news pretty much all the time now. Increasing temperatures and ocean acidification. So we expect that uh, continued warming will accelerate, it, accelerate the ecosystem changes that are driven by each of these pieces, and they'll interact in, in new and novel ways. And that will, in turn, make adaptation more challenging. So in the, in the uh, Alaska chapter, there's a, a cartoon that looks like this um, that illustrates the kinds of changes that you get with uh, expected warming in a place, say, like the Bering Sea. And uh, in the past, you have what's called a benthic-dominated ecosystem um, that's, that's driven uh, in terms of its primary productivity by ice algae and less so by phytoplankton. And then the uh, rest of the ecosystem follows from there. Um, if you change in the future to a warmer world with less sea ice, you get a switch in the dominant um, a source of uh, productivity in, the, in those systems, and that has cascading influences for all of the, the species that um, we're used to seeing as indicators, uh, including the fish species you expect to see, which kinds of whale is dominant, which kinds of uh, marine mammals are dominant, um, and uh, specifically big impacts on the nature of the bird community that depends on the, the surface ocean productivity that follows from this. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, new science that wasn't completed before about the middle of 2017 didn't really make it into the NCA4. And we've already heard critiques that well, NCA4 didn't consider these changes in the Bering Sea, and that's because there's a cutoff for the peer review process. But we've seen in the last year and a half huge changes in the Northern Bering Sea. And in 2018, the, something called the Northern Bering Sea cold pool was virtually non-existent. So in normal years, um, in, the, in the past, there's a, a pool of cold water that sits on the bottom of the Bering Sea and has a huge influence on the structure of the fish community that uh, then impacts things like seabirds. And they've been actually keeping track of this um, via trawling for over 37 years at NOAA. And on the left here, I've got some graphics that show the size and, and temperature of that cold pool in the Bering Sea going back just the last decade. There are more years in the original report, and there's data for many more beyond that. But you can then see in the rainbow-colored graphic on the right in 2010 and 2017, those purple colors indicate where the cold pool was located and how cold it measured. Uh, and then on the right, uh, for 2018, you can see that it's essentially non-existent. And, um, the, uh, there's a northward migration of fish that don't ordinarily inhabit these waters that eat a lot of the smaller fish that are um, the food source for some of the seabirds. And so there's this cascading effect in this ecosystem, much as that cartoon I showed you a minute ago um, demonstrated, but now there's very clear impacts. And these then affect bird communities that are of, of interest to uh, both Fish and Wildlife Service and the Park Service. Um, the second key message I'm going to highlight is terrestrial processes, and there's a lot tied up in here in terms of the impacts to terrestrial ecosystems and the things that affect them. These are of direct importance to habitat for many um, species of uh, land animals in Alaska that, we're, that we're, we think of as, uh, as important or charismatic or uh, um, indicators of, of ecosystem health in our region. Um, permafrost thaw, coastal and river erosion, uh, increasing wildfire, and glacier melt, all of these interact to change the nature of the landscapes uh, that we're familiar with, and also how they look to, to visitors, for example, for the Park Service. And uh, all of these, or some of them in aggregate together, uh, are fundamentally going to change the landscapes that we, um, that we think we know in Alaska. Uh, I'll highlight fire as an example. That was one of the things that was suggested I, I focus on. There's three panels for Alaska here. The one on the left uh, shows historical fire scars from 1950 to 2009. So in case you weren't aware, uh, maybe for some of our visitors outside Alaska, 
Um, Alaska is already a fire prone place, but primarily that's true between the Alaska Range and the Brooks Range, so the, the Yukon River Valley, which is most of the area that's highlighted in those reds. You can see that a substantial fraction of, of the landscape has burned um, between 1950 and 2009, and uh, that's not abnormal. We think that that's a characteristic part of the boreal forest. How much it is burning is definitely increasing, and that's definitely related to climate change, but it's a key piece of the landscape here. What we have seen uh, more recently that is, uh, we think, less um, uh, characteristic of the historical range of variability or the natural range of variability is an increase in tundra fires. And the middle panel shows you where some of those have been occurring. And Alaska has several different kinds of tundra. You shouldn't, all, you shouldn't think of it just as what you find on the tops of mountains where you go hiking. There's, there's different kinds here, and they're um, differentially prone to catching on fire. But uh, we've seen an increase in tundra fires in, in the recent past. And then on the right are changes in 21st century burn frequency um, from a modeling effort uh, by our colleagues at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And it's just one climate model's projection. But those reds show places where you get an increase in the burn frequency. And they're outside, for the most part, the areas where we're used to seeing a lot of fire in the historical period. So you see uh, an increase in, in um, conifer invasion and tundra that brings fire with it. You also see an increase in the potential burning of of tundra that we, we don't see historically. And so the changes on the landscape as a function of fire frequency are expected to be quite profound. Um, the rate of landscape change, given those disturbances and climate change, will not be something we've got experience with. Uh, much of that area is likely to um, transition to deciduous shrubs and deciduous tree species rather than the spruce we're familiar with. And it will be no on analog or unprecedented. And it may already be. There's a paper that recently came out um, looking around the whole Arctic for a number of indicators. And these are, are changes that are ongoing now. They're not something that we think of just for the end of the 21st century. So one question, uh, what does it mean? Can these rates of change be matched by the time it takes us to adapt our planning cycles? Do we have the capacity to adapt, even if our inventory and monitoring approaches tell us what we need to know? So there's an open question here whether these changes are going faster than we can keep pace with already or not. Uh, and that's a, a good a good place to start a discussion of what it means for Alaska. Um, just some numbers on that rate of change in fire. Um, our colleagues at SNAP have put together uh, some modeling efforts to understand what um, they mean in the domains of the, the, the landscape co conservation cooperatives for Alaska. And I'll just highlight the three most fire prone ones here. Um, in Arctic, in the Arctic um, Landscape Conservation Cooperative, you see an increase in kind of the middle fire year um, of doubling by the early 21st century and something like eightfold in the future. In part, that's because there wasn't historically very much fire on that landscape at all. Very similar numbers in Western Alaska LCC. Um, what you also see is a, an increase in the frequency of what we might think of as extreme fire years. So historically, that would be something like a one in 20, and you look at something like a one in five or one in six, um, moving up towards something closer to a, a one in three in the in the um, late 21st century. For Northwest Boreal LCC, which is kind of in the middle of the state, it's the blue one there, um, there's a, an increase, you know, roughly a doubling um, in, uh, in the relatively near future and then a little more than that in the, the late 21st century. This is an area that's already fire prone, but you actually get a decrease um, in, uh, in some places in that landscape because of the change from shrubs, I, I'm sorry, from uh, spruces to, uh, to less flammable vegetation. And the probability of exceeding that extreme year, um, while still greater than 1 in 20, doesn't increase as much as, much as it does in those other ecosystems. These places are expected to change quickly because of fire alone. It's worth noting that the changes in permafrost thaw and the consequences for things like thermokarst and other changes aren't even indicated here. And so the, the total rate of landscape change could be quite fast. So the last key message that I was asked to focus on is the consequences for indigenous peoples. And the subsistence activities, the culture, the health, and infrastructure of Alaska's native communities are uh, subject to all of these impacts. In some cases, several of them, not all. Um, in other cases, just a few of them. But in aggregate, those are expected to, to change um, the, uh, the nature of those communities and the, the health of people quite profoundly. Flexible, community-driven adaptation strategies would lessen those impacts by ensuring the climate risks are considered in the full context of who's there and what their cultures are like and what they've experienced in the historical past. Um, 
So the combination of permafrost thaw, sea ice decline, and storms cause coastal erosion, and they undermine the stability of these communities just in a physical sense because you're losing shoreline and it impacts infrastructure, but also in a cultural sense. So it's not just the community's location. It's also the community itself, health, the well-being, the culture of the people who live there. It also affects access to traditional foods and seasonal transportation routes. Those have become less predictable and more dangerous. We see headlines um, almost weekly this spring of uh, uh, changes in river and sea ice uh, causing um, near accidents or even fatal accidents of people out uh, pursuing the, uh, the uh, traditional foods that sustain their communities. The infrastructure is also vulnerable, even if the people themselves are adaptable. Um, the, an example, a couple examples of these are uh, our water supply um, and the ways that permafrost affects those, um, and then the way that wildfire smoke affects these communities. If you think about where they are on the transportation network, once there's enough smoke to limit air transportation, they can't leave and they don't always have um, sufficient um, air conditioning and structures uh, to escape smoke. So there's been an effort, for example, to create safe spaces for elders um, and youth and other people that are uh, uh, respiratorily impaired uh, so that they're safe from wildfire smoke. But if you get an increase in, in wildfire and an increase in smoke, you have an increasing effect in those communities as well. So in aggregate, the community and health consequences are challenges to food security, culture, and adaptive capacity. In many ways, it's very different in its nature from the kinds of impacts that we're expected to adapt to in more developed areas and the kinds of communities we're used to thinking about in the lower 48. Uh, relocation, different hunting and harvesting locations and techniques are all um, are potential adaptation responses, but they require fundamental changes in just the nature of living and making a, a, a living in those regions. So, uh, Lee asked me a couple questions that I'll now take a couple minutes to respond to. Um, I know I've rushed through a lot of information, um, but uh, hopefully it can get us started. She asked me, one of the questions was, what concerns me? And I'm going to show you these graphs. Um, actually, this is a, a good time, Larry, for our first um, poll question, if, if we can bring that up. And I'm not sure how I will see it, but we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, so is uh, Philip, I have a couple. Is that the one, what is the least skillful weather forecast or what is the most uncertain climate projection? Uh, let's start with the first one. All yeah, right. Yeah, the weather projection one or the weather forecast. Weather forecast. So I'm going to launch the poll. This will be showing up on everyone's screen. You have three options. What is the least skillful weather forecast? Please select one. Your options are one to two days, four to seven days, 10 to 14 days. I see so far the votes are starting to trickle in. We've got about one third of you that have voted already. I'm going to leave it open a little bit longer. We're up to half participation already. Looks like we're getting a pretty consistent spread. Okay, I'm going to let it go for another couple of seconds. And then I will close and share the results. Three, two, one. They're still coming in, but i got to cut you off. We can't stay here forever. All right. Close and share. Here we are. What are your thoughts on this? That's, uh, that's exactly what's expected, right? Because we're, we're used to thinking of the long-term skill of the forecast as being the least, because uncertainty goes up more in the future, right? But this is a trick question. It turns out, we all know that one to do day, two days is you know, pretty good relative to the others, and we're familiar with that, so not many people chose that one. Um, 10 to 14 days, it actually turns out that your best bet is the historical climatology. It's uncertain, but you have a pretty good, you have a pretty good chance of getting it at right uh, for the average. It turns out that four to seven days is kind of stuck in the middle. Uh, and you, because of the uh, chaoticness of the, the weather systems in that time frame, it's harder to predict there uh, than it is in either of the other two. And some people might argue with that interpretation, but I think that uh, generally it's, it's held out to be true. And by the time you get to two weeks, you're definitely better off with your uh, more recent historical climatology than you are with uh, the four to seven days. So good, good on you. Um, that's a hint for the next slide, though. Uh, and so Lee asked me what surprises me. And one of the things, or sorry, what concerns me, uh, one of the things that concerns me is that we're used to thinking about these long-term changes um, by the kind of average of many climate models under um, various warming scenarios. 
But what we often forget is that each of those models is a very bumpy version of that, that average, right? The future we expect for a given emission scenario isn't just that average, it's the, the bumpy part of it. So the, the future is a bumpier one than the past. And that's just for temperature, right? That's the easiest thing to project. Precipitation, snowpack, ecosystem consequences are all harder. The climate variability and the extremes that go with it, we know those things are going to still occur. I myself have a lot of snow-dependent recreation, and, uh, and you know, if I want to be selfish and think about my, my privilege, then that's where it hits me first, is in my recreation. But the ecosystem and the place that sustains me um, is also subject to those impacts. And so expecting just the trend and the variability may not be enough. The things that we predict the worst are the things that are going to impact and, and will feel the most and the, possibly the soonest. So then the, the next poll is actually, I maybe already gave it away a little bit, but uh, can we cue that one up? Yes, it's going live here in just a second. All right, here we are, just to read it out for you. Which is the most uncertain climate projection? Three options, 10 to 20, 30 to 50, 70 to 100 years. We've got one fifth of you that have already selected your response. These guys are on the ball, Larry. I don't <laughs> we know we got a group paying a lot of attention today. We're all the way up to 60% voted. I'm going to close it out when we hit three quarters, just about there. And okay, three, two, one, close and share. Look at this. All right. Here. Maybe, maybe some people were swayed by that last example. This one's also a little bit of a trick question. Um, but I'll assume that if we'd had a few more, the, the bottom one would have increased and you'd be right. It's actually the uncertainty increases the further forward you go in time for climate modeling. And that's because it comes from several different sources, not just the chaoticness of the system. In 10 to 20 years, the, the natural variability is the biggest uncertainty in terms of, of projection. Um, for 30 to 50 years out in the future, it's the difference among climate models, what's included in them, what skill they have, what, what science is embedded within them. And there's some variation there, although sometimes it's just a question of timing. Uh, and then 70 to 100 years, the main source of uncertainty is the emissions, right? How, which, which emissions trajectory will we end up following, one that leads to a, a substantially warmer world or one that only leads to a warmer world than the one we're familiar with now? And so all those things add together as you go into the future. And probably the biggest one in terms of, of degrees centigrade anyway is that 70 to 100 years. So good job. Um, the next thing that Lee asked me, and this is the last thing I'll do before I close out, is what surprises me. And hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, I study this stuff for a living. And in the last five or so years in Alaska, I was not able to plan my seasonal calendar for the changes that have occurred just in the time I've come back here. I grew up here. I feel like I have a good feel for what you ought to do when uh, in terms of, of recreation and the things that we depend on in Alaska. Um, but fish, berries, and recreation are not when and where I expect them, even now. I thought that was going to be a problem that my kids face. But it turns out it's not. It's here now. And, um, and so that reminds me that elsewhere in the state, where people have access to fewer resources and where the impacts are proceeding even quicker, um, the things that we used to know and that guided our expectation of what was going to happen next and that allowed us to make the plans that we do are no longer things that we can uh, necessarily hold true. It doesn't mean that our past experience is useless, but it means that we have to take it with a grain of salt and use our future expectations and also the surprises we're likely to encounter as a, a thing to consider in our planning. So with that, I'm going to turn it over back to Larry and Kat and Lee. And, uh, if you have questions or, uh, or want to contact me about what I didn't cover or things that I covered too quickly, I'm always happy to help. These are dialogues that could go on for a long time to bring us all up to the level of each of the experts contributed to the NCA core and all the things that have happened to this. With that, I'll hang it up. Hey, thanks so much, Jeremy. Really appreciate it. So much thought-provoking in that presentation, and Matt and I were just talking about the fact that we're in communications, and we sort of relish the challenge of trying to explain to general audiences how increases in rainfall and snowpack could lead to a drier Alaska. Really thought-provoking and great stuff. 
Um, I think in the interest of time, what we might want to do is segue directly into our upcoming panel session. Jeremy's not going anywhere. He's going to stay with us and uh, join us for the panel session. I want to remind all participants that we have an opportunity here for back and forth. If you have questions for Jeremy as we go into the panel session, go ahead and populate that questions box or raise your hand. We'll put you in the queue to bring your voice into the room. But right now, I think I want to go ahead and introduce um, our next guest. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ms. Lee Welling. And many of you know Lee already. Lee's the Associate Regional Director for Science, Communications, and Partnerships in the National Park Service Alaska region. She oversees inventory and monitoring, research coordination, uh, interpretation and education, public communications, the River and Trails Program, International Affairs, and the Beringia Program. Uh, Lee also supervises, supervises management of the northern tier of Alaska parks. She previously served as Regional Chief Scientist for Alaska, and she has some familial ties with us here in the Climate Change Response Program. She was the first chief. So, Lee, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to kick you control. And, uh, again, thanks for taking the time. We're excited to have you. You have the floor. Great. Thanks, Larry, and thanks for um, putting all the work into doing this webinar. And, uh, Jeremy, I really appreciate it's hard to summarize all that information. You did a great job, and I really appreciate your insights as well. Um, I'm going to need technical help to get the webinar to come up, though, because we've got three different monitors going on here. Okay. From our perspective, we can see your slide filling up our screen. We can see your webcam. So on our end, at least, things are looking great. All right. So we have the unfortunate um, situation, I guess, of being on the cutting edge of climate change up in uh, Alaska parks. But on the plus side, we have a lot of knowledgeable people on the topic, and that includes the scientists like Jeremy and others and scientists in the Park Service, as well as our managers. Um, two weeks ago, we did a um, held a meeting of the Alaska Leadership Council in Fairbanks, and we took advantage of the proximity to many of why did that go away again? To many of our climate change experts to hold a panel. Here we go. Um, we didn't have speakers on all the aspects of climate change, but we had a really strong agenda. This is uh, on your screen right here. And I'm going to, believe it or not, give you just a few of the takeaways. I'm going to apologize to all these people in advance because I've got four minutes left. So. From Maggie, it's important to keep in mind the scale of the issues that we're grappling with in Alaska. Individual units are millions of acres in most cases, and as a region, we span a huge range of ecosystems. As we've already heard from Jeremy, we've seen rapid persistent warming statewide, especially in the past five years. This is cause for concern about how the temperature change may be playing out in other systems. Overall, our glaciers are slowly and steadily melting. Land terminating glaciers are losing mass at an incremental but an accelerating rate, which is driven by climate, by summer temperatures. Um, our tidewater glaciers have their own fluctuations that aren't driven by climate, um, and some may be advancing, but on a regional scale, the majority are retreating. So there's a climate signal um, in the long term as well. And also, as Jeremy pointed out, with permafrost, we're seeing ice loss in the ground. Permafrost in the Arctic parks is continuous across 90% or more of the landscape to the south. Permafrost is more variable, um, discontinuous, um, or uh, isolated. And uh, Dave Swanson showed this sort of um, textbook example of when climate warm permafrost can break down by either a deepening of the active layer, that layer that freezes seasonally, or by degrading, such that parts of the soil no longer freeze at all. How much that you see that at the visible surface depends on how much ice is in the soil. And while we understand the processes pretty well, and we know generally how much ice there is, we're not good at predicting the state change, when and where it will happen, um, and how that's going to manifest on the landscape at any particular time or location. So that's as Jeremy pointed out, that's very problematic. Um, Jeremy did a great job of giving us an overview on vegetation change um, and some of the different issues. 
permafrost, other drivers, all of those affect um, our landscape level changes. And this, um, so for vegetation, it encompasses a, a wide number of processes that we're talking about, including green up, tree line expansion, biomass, um, et cetera. But the concerns are that these changes aren't just occurring gradually, that we're going to see threshold shifts. And those are punctuated, unexpectedly rapid shifts to a different state. So not only are we Starting to see that in the physical system, we're quite concerned that we're going to see that in the biological systems as well. Also, as southern species move north, Alaska uh, will likely lose its endemic diversity, um, and that's concerning for a lot of <laughs> residents, especially. And beyond the changes to ecosystems and resources, and Jeremy, you touched on this, um, people aren't yet willing to accept the new reality. So as we see things change and it's outside of our norm and there's no analog, the question is whether people are going to be, are motivated um, to accept it, face it, and, uh, and, and talk about what is it we can do. Um, with fire, uh, I think that he covered this pretty well. One of the points that Jennifer Barnes made is that we're starting to see fires reburning on previous burns. So not only seeing, uh, we have longer seasons and we see more area burns, um, but there's, but uh, fires are starting to behave differently. And we're still managing from a historical perspective. So resource management plans don't yet include fire management plans for the future. Well, we need to start thinking that way. And for these areas like tundra and fire and coastal areas, um, these are very big unknowns. Um, what I want to mention here uh, is people, and I do appreciate that that was one of the topical areas we're seeing that included more and more in the national assessment as well as the IPCC. Um, I'm going to shift here just a little bit in the coastal area, which Philip is also going to talk about here in a minute. Um, nowhere is the connection between the environment and people and people's livelihoods more important than along the coastline. Hunting and fishing sustains Alaskans, so whether it's for subsistence, commercial, recreational, or personal use, uh, this is a fundamental challenge. And I, uh, Jeremy mentioned the seabird die-off. This is, I think, a, a really good graphic of that that shows how, over the past five years, uh, when we've seen this rapid, persistent warming, the North Pacific was affected by a number of events. And the top shows seabird die-off with the circles um, indicating the size and the duration and the uh, type of species affected, and then the orange bars are different um, areas in the ocean with above normal sea surface temperature. And again, I think Philip's going to go into some detail with that, but um, this is, these events are starting to occur a lot more frequently and more widespread. So my last point, just um, and I, uh, to put a fine point on um, this, uh, cold pool, the loss of the cold water barrier that Jeremy was talking about. Uh, this was a huge surprise. Um, this happened in one season, the breakdown between the, in the cold water barrier between the Bering and the Chukchi, and it's the first time um, since we've been doing surveys out there in 37 years. So we use the word unprecedented a lot. Um, I think in this case it's really quite warranted, and for many of us, we're starting to wonder if we're seeing an actual state change in the ocean. So with that, I would uh, kick it over to Philip Hoogie. I think Matt's going to make the transition, and I'm going to introduce Philip. Philip is currently the superintendent of Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve um, in southeast Alaska. The park covers more than 3.2 million acres. It was established in 19. 18 actually for science in order to study rapid glacial retreat and successional processes. So he's going to talk about the living laboratory capability. Um, Philip has a PhD in integrated biology from the University of California, Berkeley. Previous to being the superintendent at Glacier Bay, he was the assistant superintendent for resources, science, and learning at Denali National Park, where he oversaw programs to study. Um, the impacts of climate change, interpret the findings for the public, and deal with the management consequences of those changes. And he also was uh, a marine ecologist at Glacier Bay, so he's come full circle. Hey, Philip, we oh. can 
see you on our webcam, but we do not see your presentation. Instead, we're just seeing your desktop. Um, if you have another monitor, drag it over there. Let me see if that works. Sorry about that. No problem. Do that. So now we can see your outline view. Yeah. Any hands? I think we're going to get with this. Or, or do you want to run it from your side? All right. Um, we can do that. And you just let me know when you want to uh, advance it. So let me get that set up real quick for you, Phil. Yeah, it's showing it on the other screen. So. Okay. Okay. Are you, is everybody seeing the first slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, yes, as mentioned before, Glacier Bay was established as a living laboratory in 1925 at the behest of the Ecological Society. And it also, besides the terrestrial areas of, of over 3 million acres, it also includes jurisdiction of the marine areas of the park. Um, slide two. It's um, the location of some of the fastest and largest glacial retreat in historical time. Slide three. And um, this is the Carroll Glacier, some is showing some of the retreat. The Muir Glacier, next slide. A little bit slow in my system. And the next slide. Okay, so Glacier Bay, Bay provides an exceptional opportunity to bring the American public via boat um, to an immense um, tidewater glacier system. Over 600,000 people visit Glacier Bay, which is considered one of the crown jewels of the Alaska cruising experience. And um, this type of activity has been here in the park since its creation with steamships. Next slide. Glacier Bay provides a exceptional landscape and marinescape to study change. For example, um, latitudinal di um, differences across the bay um, correspond to the time since glaciation. And along the longitudinal axes of the park, it experiences different elevational snow and rain events, um, which allow the comparison of temperature sensitive glacier retreat um, with, a pre with precipitation sensitive um, glacial retreat. Glacier Bay's extensive historical pattern of advance and retreat is driven by physical terminal moraine tidewater factors um, rather than um, prehistoric glaciation. And um, though under the current scenario um, with climate change, um, this is dramatically affecting that. Well, under several climate change scenarios, at least for the near future, there will be tidewater glaciers at Glacier Bay. Um, there have been several punctuated events, um, principally in the marine environment, which has added significant um, management concern. And the next slide. Several of the presenters have talked about um, large scale um, rapid changes in the marine environment. Um, in Glacier Bay, this is Cascade, has gone all the way through the food chain. And uh, we see this in um, a dramatic decline in the number of whales. We're one of the few places that does individual recognition of humpback whales. And we've seen over a 58% decline in whales. And uh, well, um, you know, this is, um, and we have not seen these whales anywhere else. So we're, they're presumed dead. Um, next slide. Um, Again, this has been part of larger processes, um, and we're seeing this through um, many um, places in the food chain. I guess um, there are several parts of this slide, so just um, click through those to the next slide. Yeah, keep going to the next slide. So, um, you know, there were several of the presenters brought up um, the um, Changes in temperature, you know, 
The um, most parsimonious cause is large-scale oceanographic te um, temperature changes with um, cascading um, trophic effects. Next slide. We'll catch up. Should be on a um, oceanographic sampling. After decades of oceanographic study, um, we also know that Glacier Bay has many of the risk factors that would make it sensitive to ocean acidification. The next slide. Um, and what we found is that, uh, that we crossed the Argonite threshold for at least a couple of months each year. As a manager at Denali National Park, I was faced with more of the slow creep of change, predictable in many cases, woody, woody vegetation getting higher in elevation, fire sensitivity going up, glaciers steadily moving. As a manager at Glacier Bay, I'm struck with the potential for rapid change in unpredictable directions and with little capability for adaptive response. Next slide. This can result in pressure from the public to take actions that have no meaningful effect on the core concern. For example, um, after well numbers dropped, um, we're seeing more and more calls to restrict cruise ships. Um, which would do little to um, uh, affect whale numbers here at Glacier Bay. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. So we're going to shift to uh, Suzanne Fleet Green, our second superintendent. And just to reiterate to people what the goal here is to um, hear from a couple of our superintendents who are dealing with these changes um, in their park and we'd like to also get into a um, conversation with you all about what this means for the National Park Service and what our role is and and, and where is it do uh, do we want to go next or do we just throw up hands and say this is too big we can't can't deal with it um, so as we shift over to Suzanne um, she's the superintendent of Lake Clark National Park and Preserve. It's about 100 miles from Anchorage and encompasses over 4 million acres of wilderness areas, volcanoes, lake, and river, and coastline along the Cook Inlet. Before joining the NPS, Suzanne served as Anchorage Mayor Ethan Berkowitz's chief of staff and as state director for U.S. Senator Mark Begich. She's got a strong background um, in public service. She was born and raised in Alaska, living in Yakutat, King Salmon, and Anchorage. And she's a Sea Alaska shareholder and a tribal member of uh, Central Council of Tlingit Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska. Suzanne is a BA and a Master's of Public Policy from the University of California, Berkeley. Didn't realize we had two Berkeley alumni here. So, Suzanne. Great. Hello, everyone. Just want to do a quick sound and visual check. Can you see me, my slideshow, and hear me all right? Perfect. You are ready to go. Okay, great. Well, what you should, I'm going to start out just with some very quick slides because I know that we are short on time, but I want to start to a discussion about how, as managers and scientists working in parks, we really address some of the concerns and surprises that Jeremy talked about during his show. And as Philip mentioned, really the rapid change that we are facing. And for me with Lake Clark, it goes back really to our enabling legislation that was in the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act for the purpose of why Lake Clark was set aside as a national park. Um, and as you'll see here on the screen, it really talks about the red salmon fishery of Bristol Bay, um, the really scenic view sheds that we have in our glaciers, the volcanoes, and the high mountain peaks, as well as the iconic species, um, brown bears along our coast that visitors are coming to the park to see, but also fundamentally the role that Lake Clark place in providing and protecting subsistence resources for the Dena'ina people that surround our park and have used these park lands 
for millennia. And what does a rapidly changing climate mean for access to and availability of those subsistence resources? So just to show you a couple of things, we too um, have dramatic glacier photos. The first, the large one is from 1968 of Lake Clark Pass. And then you'll see on the inset, the more recent view of the pass. And when you think about the founding of the park, it really goes to Lake Clark Pass itself. When we were being considered for national monument status by President Johnson, this is where they started, was really, again, the scenic viewshed and glaciers of Lake Clark Pass, which now when you fly through that area, the glaciers have retreated high up into the mountains and are not crossing the river valley any longer. Um, and that means a, a number of things, not only for visitors coming through, but in terms of aviation safety as well, and the changing weather patterns that many of our visitors and our residents face every day coming in and out of the park and Lake Clark Pass. This next one goes to another key piece of our enabling legislation, which is protection of the sockeye salmon of the Bristol Bay watershed. And this is just a quick chart that shows you the warming rivers, both in Lake Clark and Katmai National Park, and these key areas where we do salmon monitoring stations and water quality stations to understand what it would mean if these water bodies get over the threshold point that the state of Alaska has set of 15 degrees Celsius for um, salmon habitat and rearing habitat. What will that mean overall for the Bristol Bay fishery where um, we are a key part of it? And then lastly, going back to subsistence resources, it's not only whether or not the resources themselves are available for the Dena'ina people, but also whether or not their traditional modes of access are available, as we've seen, and Jeremy de detailed a little bit, shifting temperatures, what that means to snowmelt, to rain episodes, to lake ice over the winter, and whether or not the local subsistence users can even access the resources that are there, much less taking into the question of the amount um, of resources that are there. And so as a manager, we have to think about the different uses of the park and how we respond to them with subsistence being a priority. And if things are changing like warming waters both in and out of our boundaries, what role does the National Park Service but also Lake Clark play in those discussions to ensure that the sockeye salmon fishery is protected um, for decades to come? What role does the National Park Service play in evaluating development projects in a changing climate? How can we truly assess the impact of some of those development projects when the environment is fundamentally changing? Is our assessment accurate? And are we able to take in the scope of that? Is our personnel structure situated in a way that we can respond to some of these, these challenges? Do we have the inventory and monitoring program to be able to detect the changes coming? Do we have the law enforcement uh, resources on the ground that may be required if, um, more user conflicts occur, or even if we have more heavy rain episodes that may require heavier use of our search and rescue capacity. And how do we make these investments before the actual changes come if, as Jeremy said, we're really facing things that we thought were five to 10 years out, but could occur next year without very much of an indication coming? So these are some of the issues, um, first and foremost, in our mind. Obviously, many of the other ones that were detailed in previous slides, like wildfire, river erosion, changing river flow, all come into play within Lake Clark as well. But I think for us in Lake Clark, we're in the transitional weather zone. We do not see the great uh, temperature change that people are seeing up north. 
but we still can help in thinking about what some of the adaptation strategies are that all Alaska parks could deploy to address these changes, as well as importantly, working with our local subsistence users, taking into consideration their traditional ecological knowledge, because they have seen changes take place before, and how we incorporate that into the science that is underpinning our management decisions. In our park, certainly those subsistence users are seeing changes before our traditional scientists are seeing those changes. And so how do we adapt our science program to address many of the questions that they are raising? How do we address potential threats to cultural resources as we're seeing erosion both um, uh, along the riverways, along the coast, and then obviously with the retreating glaciers. How do we ensure that those cultural resources are protected? So having a much larger and more in-depth conversation with our SRCs and our local residents so that we are responsive in a shorter time frame to address their concerns. With that, let's jump into, I think, what might be the last poll question real quick so we get it out there, because I know that there are a lot of Alaskans on this call, and so we want to know what you're facing as well and what your top concerns are in your park. So, Larry, if you want to queue up that last poll question, we can jump into that, and then I think I'll turn it back to Lee to facilitate the Q&A. All right, so I just launched the poll for you guys. What impacts do you see climate change having around in your park or your region? And then your options, whether infrastructure is your major one, cultural, natural resources, visitor access, or whether you're seeing all of the above. There are no right answers. Uh, it can be anything just based on what you are seeing most specifically in your location. Right now, it looks like we're up to just about half of you have voted. Um, I'm going to give it a little bit longer. This one might require a little more thought than some of our previous questions that uh, Jeremy had that, that kind of did have correct answers. This one is a little bit more of just your own reflection. I'm going to give it another 10 seconds or so. I still see some votes trickling in, so this is your last chance. Let's close it in three, two, one, close. All right, and let's see what we've got. Infrastructure at 8%, cultural natural resources at 19, visitor access at zero, all of the above, 73%. Does anyone in our panel, I know Lee, you're, you're taking over next, did, uh, uh, you have uh, something you wanted to say about this or anyone else in our panel? Well, I thought it'd be 100% all of the above, but. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm gonna close out that poll. Okay. Larry, what's next? Uh, Lee, if you want to go ahead, we've got a couple questions that are rolling in here, and Matt, if you want to kick me the presenter role, um, I'll take I, that. I think you guys go ahead and take it back, and, and we have um, a room of around 15 or 20 people here that I'm going to offer them to, since we're live, I'm going to offer them to come up and ask a question um, not on mute, but why don't you start with questions that have come in on the chat? I think that's great. We'll do that, and glad to have folks in the room weigh in. And anyone that's online, again, just use that raise your hand button if you want to bring your voice into the room and ask a question vocally as well. Uh, Matt, what do we got? Yeah, and first I would like someone pointed out that I said at the last poll question there are no right answers. I should have said there were no wrong answers. <laughs> I, I hope the gist got across either way, but uh, that happens sometimes, and you get put on the spot like that. Um, we didn't so the first question. Oh, what was that? I'm sorry. I said we didn't want to point that out, but we noticed. <laughs> Ever, okay, everyone noticed but me. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So we have questions actually both for Jeremy as well as for some of the park 
folks as well that have come in already. Jeremy, I'll start with you since it's been the longest since you've had a chance to speak. Um, this is from a friend of the program, Mr. Morris, uh, John Morris there in Alaska. Do you have any favorite source for maybe some of the most recent imagery and data for, you know, ice extent for uh, Alaska parks, such as Glacier Bay and, and impacts to some of the, the glaciers up there? Anything that comes to mind for you as far as data sources or imagery? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't have necessarily any favorite data sources uh, because we often use a bunch of different things to get um, ideas of what's going on for any particular question. But for the question of sea ice and also for um, glacier um, and or mass balance, um, uh, for the glacier stuff, I go to my colleague Shadow Neal across the street here at USGS because they use a lot of different satellite input as well as a direct measurement to get a handle on what's going on year to year, month to month with glaciers. Uh, for sea ice, it's often um, products that come out of the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Colorado, and, um, and we rely a lot on, um, on different satellite-driven uh, products from them to understand what's going on with sea ice on a sub-seasonal time scale because a lot of times those impacts are, are um, high necessity things we need to have a handle on at a quicker, quicker snapshot rate, if you will, than, than the glacier changes. Excellent, and I would like to remind our participants as well, if you do have follow-up questions, um, all of our speakers have volunteered uh, to share, we will share their email addresses with you, so you can follow up with them directly after the fact. That'll be in the follow-up email you'll be receiving from Larry later. So if you need additional info on those sources, uh, you'll be able to, to get that. Can I, can I add one thing too? Um, another uh, another source is the Alaska Ocean Observing System, or AUS, um, which is a collaboration between the university system and the Alaska Sea Grant and others. They have a lot of really good real-time information on their website that you might um, take advantage of, too, and a lot of that's presented in ways that are easy to access on the web by people in offices. Quite useful. Great. Uh, Matt also, and Larry, we have a question here in the room. Can we ask one live? Please do. Okay, hi, this is uh, Dave Pear. I'm the regional wildlife biologist uh, here in the uh, regional office. Um, and my question, first of all, thank you very much for all the presenters for very informative uh, presentations. Um, it, it occurs to me that, that much of our sort of management paradigms are based on stable environments or environments that are changing in, in somewhat of a predictable manner. And, and when I think about, you know, Lee had brought this up, that some of the changes we're likely to see in the future may be driven by threshold effects resulting in rapid phase shifts in the environment and resources and all of the things that, that the presenters mentioned. And I wondered, I, I just put it out there and I wondered if any of the, uh, the managers might care to comment on how we might sort of adjust our, our expectations or our paradigms to be uh, more responsive or adaptive to rapid ecological and resource change. Thank you. Well, Dave, um, I can jump in. When we were in Fairbanks, Lee mentioned the panel that we had, and one of the questions that we asked those those panelists was um, the same thing that Jeremy answered is, what are the surprises coming that we need to be aware of? And what we came to is that as managers, we need to be asking our scientists as well as our subsistence users, what are the big changes that we might not be expecting, like you said, based on our stable change model, but if there is a threshold change. And we got a little bit of an inclination in terms of some of the glacial retreat, and not so much the retreat itself, but dramatically changing um, river flow and river corridors. So what does that again, again mean to subsistence users? 
who have used that corridor for thousands of years or even park infrastructure that may be built around that. So I think as managers, again, we, we need to make sure that we have the flexibility in our authority to make decisions quickly to respond to those as well as support from our leadership, which I know we have here in the Alaska region, to move assets to address something that might uh, rapidly change. And for Lake Clark, at least, again, because we're in that transitional zone, I feel like we have a bit of a buffer, but many of these things are going to occur outside of our park boundary. And so how do we engage in those conversations? So for us with the Bristol Bay salmon fishery, a lot of the those things will be affected by changes outside of our boundaries. So how can we make sure that we're engaged in those conversations so that either we can change our management or we give feedback to whether it's the state of Alaska or NOAA or some other agency in terms of things that they might be considering for allocation, for resource um, development, for you know, habitat improvement. Um, let, let me add some stuff to that. Um, for, for Glacier Bay, you know, I think you know some of the some of the key issues are you know having a a robust and diverse um, monitoring program that allows us to um, you know be able to see things happening in other areas that we may not um, have had a prime focus on. And, and the other one is for management decision making, um, you know, doing the type of scenario planning where you can, um, you know, you, you, you plan in some of these black swan events and, and see how that would uh, change the dynamic of how you manage or, or what research you do or, you know, how you respond to the public. Great, Lee, did you have anything you wanted to add or should I move on to some of the other questions we've had so far? Yeah, I think let's move on and get some other questions so we maximize the time. Those are good answers. Excellent. Okay, here's another one that was aimed at our, our park manager staff it is, okay, and this came in when we were hearing all these impacts and wow, you know, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And the question is, well, as park managers, what, what can we do in the face of all these kinds of changes? Is it something uh, that we just have to sit back and watch? Do we have a, a role to play in this somehow? Wondering if we could get some thoughts exactly on, on what we do about this. Um, this, this is Philip. I mean, I, I think one of the key things is, is, is not taking the wrong management action. I mean, not, you know, um, not cutting out cruise ships because well numbers go down when it's really caused by climate change. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that um, we can look at some of these trajectories. You know, I, I, you know, here one of the questions we're facing is as, a, as a, one of the fundamental purposes of this park, I mean, enshrined in this legislation is allowing people to approach the glacial environment. We have um, had the luxury of being able to close off certain areas um, for seal populations. Um, we probably are gonna be faced with a situation where um, we need to let people in those because those will be the remaining places with tidewater glaciers and we'll have to balance out um, the, the seal situation with that, with that primary purpose. Any other uh, possible responses to this one? I've got two more in the queue, so there is time if someone else wanted to speak to this. Well, so this is Lee. I was thinking that um, both Suzanne and Philip, you know, also answered this question um, initially. And I know, and Suzanne, you mentioned a lot of, you asked some other questions, and you also mentioned some other uh, ways in which we need to engage. And I guess my my follow-up to all of this is, is, is the role primarily one of communicating? Um, I mean, we do our internal conversations and we can have these 
discussions within our monitoring program and uh, work with the manage management of parks on are we addressing the potential for threshold shifts. But in terms of that communication outside of the park, and especially with communities and with subsistence communities, is that, are, am I hearing that there should be, you know, we should somehow formalize this topic, or is it just sort of up to the individual superintendent if they're inclined, or I kind of want to follow up on what that engagement should look like and what, where the opportunities are. Well, this is Suzanne. I'll jump in to follow up on my earlier comments. I think in Alaska, we're lucky that we have so many local residents who have a long, long history with the resources that predates the National Park Service and how we really use that information. And I think finding out, I mean, we meet regularly with our subsistence resource users. Maybe we do increase that frequency. Maybe we think about tribal consultation more broadly as it relates to climate change. I also think that there's more that we can do as the Park Service in Alaska to use some of the other forums that go on around the state to ensure that we are in the places that we need to be listening to those conversations because they are not ones that are always hosted by the Park Service or hosted in our parks, but they're going on in Anchorage, in our rural communities, at Alaska Federation of Natives, so that we are detecting those questions and concerns as broadly as possible. So I do think it's a large communication role, but then taking what we hear and trying to have an interdisciplinary conversation about how that affects our management of the resources. Let me add one thing too. Uh, you know, I, I think the parks, you know, have one of the best soapboxes um, available to, you know, of anyone in the federal government. I mean, we we are the places where the American public goes to um, recreate and um, on public lands. And you know, for, in Glacier Bay's case, you know, it is, it's been talking about climate change. Uh, Six hundred thousand visitors uh, extensively as part of the programs, and you know, in the time frame. Um, you know, I've been here. I've not seen one single complaint from the public about that. They, when it's when we utilize place-based um, examples, um, like we have in the parks, we 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 get a wide reception of that message. Excellent. Um, there's actually been some more questions that have come in, and I realize it's six minutes still to go. We probably won't get to all of them, so I do apologize if anyone submitted something in the queue and we don't quite have time for it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of go in the order that we received some of these. This is one for any of the panelists. Um, this was first mentioned by Jeremy, and it sort of was a light bulb moment for one of our listeners about uh, prescribed fire. Um, the question is, perhaps this is an erroneous perception, but Alaska isn't an area that we typically think of use of prescribed fire as a part of managing ecosystems. Are managers in Alaska either now using or contemplating the use of prescribed fire as an adaptation measure to pre preempt fire that can occur under extreme events? I'll uh, try to take a crack at that one. Um, Randy Jant, if she were on the phone, might correct me if I get it wrong, but generally speaking, uh, a couple things are different in Alaska that, um, that have that as less an issue. Um, and less a tool that we think of as an adaptation tool. Uh, the first is that a lot of the fires that occur, especially in the areas that I highlighted earlier, um, have effects on people, but they don't occur typically right where people tend to live. And so they're not often direct threats to communities or, or necessarily even structures. Um, so it's often less of a, 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 a prescribed fire can, can help with that problem issue. Um, the other is that, um, you know, a lot of the burnable or frequently flammable area of Alaska is very um, difficult to access via the road network. You're often uh, limited um, in access to air travel or sometimes river travel, but in any case, the cost per acre of, uh, of prescribed fire goes up dramatically. I think in areas 
Um, on some of the military bases, for example, there is a, a program specifically for that. And I think you might be starting to see it in some of the more developed parts of the state, but that's a very small fraction of the total landscape. When I was a um, deputy at Denali, we had extensive discussions about the potential use of fire to um, mosaic the landscape a bit more um, and um, make it robust to the changes, um, you know, given some of these punctuated um, events. But it, it, it was it's definitely a paradigm shift for the National Park Service. And, one that's going to take a while to to um, evaluate. Excellent. Hey, um, it, we are just about knocking on the door of our a lot of time, and we want to be really respectful of everyone's time on here and get you out at exactly um, half past the hour. So, I would very much like to see the discussion continue. We have a few questions that are outstanding. We apologize to those of you that have, in fact, submitted questions we haven't gotten to. However, as we mentioned earlier, we're going to be able to share our contact information for all of our panelists and presenters today. And so we invite you to follow up with them regarding specific questions on any of the subject matter we've reached on today. Um, we'd like to extend our real sincere gratitude to everyone who participated on this call, the attendees, presenters, the panelists, and there's a cast of characters behind the scenes who's also assisted in pulling this session and others in the series together. And so thanks to all. We really appreciate that. Just as soon as we end this broadcast, a pop-up's going to appear through the webinar interface requesting your response on a really brief survey. So please take a moment and just fill that out. Your responses today go a long way in helping us shape and form subsequent iterations of this down the line going forward. As a reminder, we're going to be holding multiple sessions of these focused on different geographic regions of the National Climate Assessment, and uh, those will be rolling out throughout the year. And again, we have a link that we can share with you where you can find recordings of previous sessions. This one will be available in just a few days, as well as a schedule of all the upcoming ones in the series as well. We're going to leave you here with uh, a reminder of the key takeaways that Jeremy shared with us earlier during his presentation from the Alaska chapter of NCA4. In the days ahead, you'll also receive a follow-up email from us with links to the recorded webinar, contact info for all the presenters, and a few other goodies that we've got that we'll be sharing as well. On behalf of our Seltzer and Climate Change Response Program, thanks again to all of you for joining us here at the roundtable, and we hope you have a great day going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for the attendance. Uh, we don't get rounds of applause too often. That's pretty good. <laughs>